Hi, my name is Mike Gabin and welcome to mission 19 of this KSP campaign. Oh my, do we have a big one today. At 33 meters high and about 125 tons, this rocket is not too far below the maximums allowed on my tier 2 launch pad. And almost three times the mass of my previous record holder, the Polar Orbiter from episode 5. Of course, you know a big rocket is a result of a large payload. 15.8 tons of payload, in fact, eclipsing the 3.8 ton Polar Orbiter. And lifting that much with relatively low tech didn't come without challenges. Yeah, Jeb and Bob got a wild ride here resulting from too many radial boosters crammed too close together. What I ended up with was a central core surrounded by four additional stacks of tanks held on by a few struts. At the bottom of the stack of tanks are five Reliant engines and a pair of a new engine, the Mark 55 Thud liquid fuel engine. These seven engines were required to give me the thrust to weight ratio I wanted, but were still inadequate to kick it off the pad. For that, I needed an additional four BACC SRVs, which are being, correction, were being held on by the newly unlocked TT-70 radial decouplers. Four SRVs and three of the Reliance were ignited at launch, with the final two Reliance and the Thuds only coming online after the SRVs were staged. The other new parts are the 2.5 meter Rockomax decoupler with the Rockomax adapter to make the transition between the 1.25 meter and 2.5 meter parts. Having to break into the 2.5 meter parts for the first time is a big reason why this launch got so big. This ascent is going really well perhaps a little steep and about a degree from the preferred heading of 90 degrees, but I just kept the vehicle locked on the programme vector throughout most of the ascent with very little adjustments on my part. Fiddling too much with controls will lower the efficiency of the launch. I'm really happy with how well this flies. It's surprisingly rigid without having to go crazy with the strutting, nor do I even use the auto strut feature. I guess the classic KSP noodle rockets really are a thing of the past. I suppose the Kerbals actually learned the well. If you're interested in the ship, you will find a link to the craft file in the description. With the ascent seemingly well in hand, let's get to the mission. We've got a total of four contracts. The first is to explore the moon, which actually is only has a single requirement, which is to perform an EVA in near space about the moon. Contract number two is to get some scientific data from the surface of the moon. To accomplish that, Jeb and Bill have a second vehicle tucked under this fairing. From the size of the fairing, and from my level on the tech tree, many of you are likely guessing that this isn't a crewed lander. Well, your guess is correct. This vessel is plenty big enough without adding a crewed landing requirement to it. And that mass is thanks to the fourth contract, which is to test the RE-15 skipper engine in orbit about the moon. That engine alone is three tons of payload mass. Moreover, I can't activate it until I am in the required lunar orbit, so I need even more engines to get me there, but I'll talk about those specific designs once I've gotten our low carbon orbit. Finally, contract number three on the list is to perform low altitude temperature scans above the moon's surface. As you can see, we've got a lot going on in this mission. In the meantime, we are just finishing off our low orbit insertion. I'll squeeze out as much as I can out of this booster. With such a complicated mission, I want to save as much fuel as I can. Okay, that's 60 kilometers on the periapsis stage. I still want that in the atmosphere so the booster can deorbit. There are no parachutes on any stages of the ascent vehicle. I just couldn't afford to wait. The orbiter is running off another pair of thud engines that I tucked in alongside the skipper engine using the translation tools in the VAB. In fact, I think they look pretty good there. Okay, that's LKO established and our solar panels oriented towards the sun. Let's take a closer look at the ship that Bob and Jeb will be calling home for the next few days. Its most dominant feature is the RE-15 skipper engine down there at the bottom, which is nothing but dead weight until we get into the required lunar orbit. 
so that required the addition of two radial thud engines. All told, that adds up to 4.8 tons of engines, a stat that dominated the design of this whole mission. It's easy to design moon missions like this using only the half-ton Terrier for propulsion. Carrying over 4 tons of extra engine means more mass for fuel, and it's easy to see why this thing got as big as it did. In addition, the 2.5 meter skipper doubled the width of the ship, the transition being handled by another Rocco Max adapter. This width presented an additional problem as my original idea was to mount the thuds well forward on the vessel and then stage the heavy skipper once I was done testing it. The problem was that the exhaust gases from the thuds blew right onto the 2.5 meter adapter. The exhaust gases running into the adapter created a counterforce working against propelling the vehicle forward. The net result was almost no acceleration. I had hoped the thuds were forward enough that the adapter wouldn't interfere so much, but clearly that wasn't the case. That's when I decided to move the thuds alongside the skipper. Other solutions may also have worked would have been to move the thuds outwards, away from the fuselage using some modular girders, or perhaps to angle the exhaust from the thuds away from the fuselage, but I suspect these solutions may have introduced their own problems. The final new part is the recently unlocked Clampatron Jr. docking port, which I used to attach our little 300 kg probe that will be going down to the lunar surface. The Clampertron Jr. has the exact same mass as the 0.625 meter stack separator, but unlike the separator, won't leave any annoying debris behind. Well, I think that's enough preamble, let's get this show on the road. The ejection burn is a pretty standard one, except for the fact that instead of shooting for a particular altitude with my periapsis, I'm aiming to hit the moon smack dab in the middle. This will be followed by a mid-course correction to bring my periapsis up to around 135 kilometers, the altitude required for the testing contract, but in a polar trajectory about the moon. It's best to do these normal corrections away from the parent body, something I've mentioned numerous times in the past, but I've never shown the math for. I really gotta do that sometime. I want the polar orbit for two reasons. One, I want to collect all the science I can over every biome, and two, the polar orbit makes it easier to get over those temperature survey waypoints. As this is my first time in this campaign getting Kerbals into the moon's sphere of influence, we should do pretty well for science. Alright, crew report. Nine science. Okay. Uh, no, we might as well transmit that. Send that off on its way. Okay. Uh, yeah, that went fine. Let's get in here and find the materials bay. There it is. Observe that. 45 science, but I can transmit 22 now, so yeah, let's transmit that. Better keep an eye on my electricity. We're doing okay. Okay, uh, yeah, and then we'll get Bob to get out there and re-submit uh, every, er, reset everything. There's a goo tucked in here, let's find that one. There we go. Oh, only 4.2 science, nothing to transmit. Oh, and I won't have any temperature or barometer science either. Uh, the reason for that is because in a previous episode I had sent a flyby and return probe that had already been in the moon's sphere of influence. So it's time to get Bob to reset everything, but why don't we start off by getting Jeb out of here. I actually do have an extra seat, so I could have transferred Jeb into the crew cabin and then, tr and then transferred Bob into the capsule uh, like I'm going to be doing right here. So I didn't have to get uh, Jeb out, but I think Jeb needed to stretch his legs. Alright, Bob, just wait there. EVA. And of course, we can do an EVA report. Let's get on there. EVA report. 14.4 science will hang on to that. We'll transmit it later, and of course Bob's going to have to go around and collect whatever science he can and reset all the equipment, but uh, once that was all taken care of, well the next step in all of this was to get down and uh, get our capture. We are still in high space here, so there is no new science to collect. 
but what I do want to get on is start knocking off some of these contracts. Alrighty, so that is our orbit, pretty much circular. Let's start by testing out the skipper. Alrighty, so run test. There we go, okay, that's it. Contract number one out of the way, and as we don't need all of these engines, and the skipper is the more efficient of these engines, we'll just shut down the thud engines that we have here. Now the thuds are going to be dead weight for the rest of this journey. We might as well keep the engine that has the highest ISP. Okay, explore the moon contract. That's going to be our next one there, and all we got to do is perform an EVA while in orbit, so Jeb. And there we go, that's contract complete. That's going to be it for our crew portion for these contracts. These other two contracts here are both going to be performed by our, our little probe. We're going to need to get it down into a low orbit so it can start to do those temperature scans, and then we are going to be uh, landing it on the surface, hopefully. So let's focus up here towards the top and look for our docking port. There it is, the Clampatron Jr. There we go, and right click, and we gotta decouple the node. Oh, hang on, why don't, let's, uh, let's focus up on the actual uh, probe for this. All right, clip this down here. Okay, decouple node. Whoa! <laughs> Maybe I should've, uh, brought down the ejection force on that uh, decoupler. That really sent that thing for a loop. Okay, we'll raise the communitron. Come on, I'm having trouble clicking on it. There we go. Communitron. That's it. Okay, so extend that antenna so we have communication. It can pick up a relay signal from uh, the crewed vessel. But actually should be able to pick up a relay signal from the communication satellite that I put in orbit about the moon a couple of episodes ago. And of course that's only when it's on the communication satellite of the moon. On Kerbin's side, uh, it can communicate with mission control directly. As for the rest of the probe, well, you know I like them simple. At only 313 kilograms, the one-third full Oscar B fuel cam provides 912 meters per second of delta V which should be enough for the required orbital maneuvering and to get us down to the surface. The only part you've not seen before are the three LV-05 micro landing struts. These are perfect for little landers like this and only weigh 15 kilograms each. Bringing the probe down to a 10 kilometer circular orbit was pretty routine. One thing I forgot was a Kerbal Engineer chip. As such, I have no extra data coming to me and we'll be just doing this using the stop tools. Now begins the tedious job of time warping until each of those waypoints passes below me. And I go, oh wait, 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 I got science. Oh my gosh, this is my first time in near space uh, about the moon. None of these, neither of these two, I got a thermometer and a barometer, neither is biome specific. So, uh, I can do these anywhere, but I might as well do them now, get it over with. So thermometer first, 15.1 science. Yeah, we'll transmit that away. And there we go, still got lots of electricity. There should also be a barometer on here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay, right click, log pressure data, 22.7 science. Yeah, so we'll transmit that away. All right, so there we go. We're done with that until we get down to the surface. And then really does become this tedious process of time warping. Uh, the moon rotates very slowly, so this is going to take a while. On the upside, the surface doesn't move much with each orbit, so you should be able to nail each of them on your first attempt. The first was ZTK75H, for which I needed to be under 10,600 meters. There we go. All right, log temperature. Okay, that's one of four done. Now the other three are all lower. And so what I did is I lowered my periapsis to under 7,400 meters, so I was under the lowest of them. 
And then of course it was more time warping. And it was during this time warping I was beginning to notice that I wasn't picking up my relay satellite when I clearly had a line of sight to it. It was only when I was pretty much directly under it that I finally got a weak signal. At first this confused me, but then I did the math and yeah, this is right. I put the relay satellite into too high an orbit to communicate effectively when the other end is just a communitron. Thankfully, the relay still had enough fuel left to move it to a circular orbit with a lower altitude of 377.35 kilometers, an altitude I pick because it gives me a period of three hours. A period that's divisible by three is nice when calculating phasing orbits. By the way, the minimum altitude that allows three communication satellites to still maintain line of sight with each other is exactly the same as the radius of the parent body. I got an easy little geometric proof for this. Sounds like another good topic for a future let's do the math. Anyway, two Kerbin days after its initial release, our probe was picking up its last temperature scan finishing off this contract. One more to go. And this one just requires me to transmit some science from the surface of the moon. My first landing of this campaign onto an alien world. I think always an exciting moment in anyone's career mode. Even if it is just a uncrewed probe. And it doesn't specify any biomes or anything like that. So I really don't care. My only stipulations is that I want to land somewhere that's relatively flat. On the uh, in the light and on the curb inside so I don't have to depend upon relays for communication because I don't have any kind of reliable network about the moon right now thankfully the curb inside was mostly illuminated so uh, going for this spot over here I believe this is the, uh, the northwest crater yeah just somewhere in there it's a nice easy target and different people have different strategies when it comes to landing. Personally, myself, I like coming in really shallow, uh, as you can see here. Uh, different people have different strategies. If you want a further discussion on landing and how I like to land, uh, you can check out my tutorial on the subject. But I think I'm just going to cut to the chase in this video. In the interest of time, I kind of like this area coming up after this big crater that I'm coming over right now. So. Why don't we start applying the brakes? And what I like to do, here, I think I want to get myself going a little bit to the left, so I'll angle myself a little that way. But I like to keep the, the craft kind of horizontal so that I'm really putting my energy towards killing off my horizontal speed. Oh, I should have maybe started braking a little bit earlier than this, but uh, it's a little probe. I'm sure we can make this work. So all I'm doing here is keeping the craft more or less horizontal. Really watching that retrograde vector on the nav ball, because as it starts to go up, that means you're killing off your horizontal velocity and you're starting to fall. You know, just after this sort of pair of craters that we're coming up right now, that still doesn't look so bad in there. That's what we're going for. Okay, we are starting to fall, so I best worry about my vertical velocity. Don't want to slam into the ground. And as we get close too, because I got the lights flashing on this thing, we should be starting to see the lights flash on the surface. That will help, and hopefully we'll see our shadow. Seeing the shadow always helps in judging the distance. Of course, the altimeter up there at the top just gives you the altitude over what's considered the moon's sea level, which is its lowest point. So we are definitely closer than two kilometers. In fact, I think this is pretty high here. Okay, we are falling straight down. All I gotta do now is watch my vertical velocity under 20 meters per second. Breaking, breaking. The later you can leave it, the more efficient it is, and oh, oh, a little bit of upsies there, and boink, down we are. Yeah, that's perfect. I think we're fine. Let's say yes, off. We are stable. Okay, all we gotta do is do some science, so pressure scan, 
That's 30.2 science to transmit, so we'll transmit that. And once this is done, there we go. That is our last contract. It has now gone green, so we can uh, get rid of that contract. Um, we also get rid of the whole contract. Plus, we can still do a temperature scan, of course. That is 20.2 science. We will transmit that as well, and well, that's it. This probe's <laughs> not much else it can do. There's nothing else here to transmit. And from the original plan, this was going to be the end of the mission. We we're just going to get our boys back home. But you know, Jebediah, in the interim, well, he's found a way to sort of scrounge out some more science. Now, remember, here, you see being in a polar orbit, it'd be best for Jeb and Bob to wait until the plane of their orbit is along the prograde retrograde vector of the moon, in other words, the direction in which the moon is going around Kerbin. So they're going to have to wait about another day or so before they're able to make a uh, their ejection anyway. So what Jeb figured is, why not lower our periapsis so it's nice and close to the moon, uh, so that our periapsis will be near where we need to do our ejection burn to get out of the moon's sphere of influence. And then that way, Bob can get himself some near moon science. And we'll get a little bit of a boost with the Oberth effect being close to the moon. I mean, not as much of a bonus as we're that will offset entirely having to make this burn in the first place. But, you know, with 471 meters per second still left in the vehicle, we can certainly afford to do that. Alrighty, so, uh, we worked this out with the nodes, but uh, I don't need a node for this. We'll just go down. Well, I'm figuring maybe periapsis around 20 kilometers. Here we are. That should give Bob, some good opportunities to pick up some EVAs over some biomes. Okay, we are in near space over the Midlands, so we'll be firing off all of our scientific equipment. Now, most of this stuff is not biome specific, so once I collect all of these temperature scans and mystery goos and materials bays and all the rest of that, uh, that will be it for that. But the EVAs in near space are biome specific, so we'll make sure to get Bob out there and collect some EVAs and also to hang around and see what other ones we can collect. And in fact, on this very first pass, we got lowlands, midlands, highlands, poles, polar lowlands, and the highland craters. I was particularly happy with that one. That's a hard one to get. But, uh, you know, Bob and Jeb are going to be hanging out here for almost a full day before they're ready for their ejection burn. And in subsequent passes, Bob was able to get the middling craters. And then on our very last pass to Periapsis, Bob was able to get the far side crater. I was really hoping to pick up the canyons here as well. But, you know, uh, we got to go home. <laughs> They've been, in home. They've been in space now for, for about uh, five days here. I think it's time for us to get them home. Yeah, Jeb is getting... Oh, oh, there we go. There is the uh, far side crater. All right, Bob would love to stay out further, but uh, Jeb had to put his foot down. It's like, Bob, get inside! <laughs> we got to get ready to get out of here. Oh, not too much on the skipper. It packs a punch. Oh, and we still got plenty of fuel left. All right, that should be it. Let's check out what we got here. You can see why the timing of this was so important, but let's check on our periapsis. Ooh, 18 kilometers. Oh, that's a little, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's gonna be a little hot. Uh, like it's closer to around 30 kilometers. But here, when you can look at my trajectory leaving the moon and how this really illustrates what how, how you're, you wanna shoot off in a the opposite direction in which the moon is going in order to get or yourself back to Kerbin and when it, you're in a, something like a polar orbit timing which orbit to do it on becomes important in making this burn efficient and of course you've seen plenty of re-entries before let's just suffice it to say that uh, on the sixth day of their mission Jeb and Bob safely 
we turn to the surface of the Kerbin. And normally I get into reading all of these messages, but there are so many and time is so short. I mean, we got some milestones here. We, we did our first spacewalk in orbit around the moon. We entered in a suborbital trajectory about the moon because we did the landing. You had to go suborbital for that. Uh, we landed on the surface of the moon, of course, and returned home from orbit in the moon. And then, of course, all the messages from the various contracts. But the big thing, of course, is the science. 321.8 science Jeb and Bob brought back with them. That's in conclusion to the stuff that we transmitted, giving us a total of 553 science to spend. And spend it I did, uh, unlocking two tier five nodes that uh, would have helped me out with this mission. Fuel systems for fuel lines and bigger fuel tanks, including the new first my first 2.5 meter tanks and heavy rocketry for the 2.5 meter engines, uh, Poodle, Skipper, and the bigger SRBs. And then two tier six nodes, including precision propulsion for some tiny engines, some separatrons, no more exploding boosters as I leave them behind, and uh, the troidal fuel tank, which I really like, and precision engineering for an improved probe body, some small st structural parts, and some better antennas, which I think I'm going to need to put these to use with what I'm thinking for next episode comes to pass. Upgraded a couple of the buildings as well, had over a million curb bucks, so maxed out tier 3 on the launch pad, no more weight and height restrictions for me. Also upgraded uh, mission control to tier three. So I'm no longer bounded by I can collect as many contracts while well as they'll offer me I suppose and that helps me shore up the contracts even further to the tune of 284,872 curb bucks to apply towards my next mission But you know that's going to have to be for the next episode in the meantime I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time